afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the program on this Wednesday, the 19th day of February here on uh, Radio.com. We'll be joined by WFAN at 6 o'clock, as always, uh, as we go through a February day, and we'll try and do some of it without spending the entire time on one subject, which has been the case in, I guess, almost every uh, buddy who does this. And has been near a microphone talking sports uh, and isn't talking about uh, politics or talking about uh, Mike Bloomberg or Bernie Sanders or the debate tonight as an example. Anybody else is talking about one subject and one subject only. And I, I think there's been so much missed on the point. Um, number one, the reason the players were not punished had nothing to do with them being given amnesty or being given clemency so they could get their information from them because they didn't provide a lot of information anyway. The reason they weren't punished is because they weren't in charge. You understand the players will push the envelope when it comes to performance. They have to be guided. The reason the people who were in authority were punished, and has one has it dawned on one player that the punishment was severe because the guys who were in charge lost their careers. They say nobody was punished. These guys have not once mentioned the managers being fired. Three managers lost their job. One general manager lost his job. They don't care about that because it doesn't affect them. Players see to the front of their nose, no father. Not one of them has mentioned that the guys who made the decisions, who were empowered with shutting it down, the people who could have said, that's over, we're done with that. That doesn't happen on my team. Those people were fired. That was proper because they were in charge of the team. The players are not in charge of the team. The players were suspended for steroid abuse because it's a personal thing that you sneak and do behind people's back. The only way of detecting is, is testing. You don't do it in front of your teammates. You don't run around and say, uh, you know what, I just ejected. But this was systematic. It was a team, and we don't know if the owner was involved. If it was, then the penalty should have been much harsher, but we don't know that he was. He was cleared. The general manager lost his job. The manager lost his job. Veltron lost his job. Cora lost his job. The penalties there were severe because they were in charge. Veltran, it's just by being part of the now being a manager, now being in a position of authority, it was felt he couldn't be in a position of authority. He didn't even wasn't even hit for what happened, even though he was considered a ringleader. But the people who could have shut it down, a player wasn't in a position to shut it down. And the players, it's laughable. We're tough, but we're not tough if an Astros traded to our team. Then we're not tough. So if he's on our team, he's forgiven because he's now on our team. Well, how ridiculous is justice if the guy did it? So if Altuve gets traded to the Yankees tomorrow, he's clear because he's now a Yankee. Or he goes to the Dodgers tomorrow, he's fine. Now we don't care what happened to him. Because otherwise, how can you stand up, as Torres did a couple of days ago, and say that the Astros, he knows, cheated in 19, in 2019. And a lot of players have still given that same statement. Many players, if you've heard them, I think they cheated last year. You've heard that everywhere, far and wide, that they cheated last year. Well, if you think they cheated last year and you're a member of the Yankees, how would you absolve the guy you just paid almost $400 million to get? He's on your team now. Go down, walk to his locker, and find out, hey, were they cheating last year on that team or not? And if he tells you he doesn't know, he's lying to your face. Nice way to start a relationship. Because he knows whether he, they were cheating last year or not. He was in the locker room. But no, he, it's like he doesn't exist. He got a pass. How did he get a pass? Came with the Yankees, so he's got a pass. The guy's on my team now, so he's free. I saw somebody give a scathing commentary on it and then was asked about Cole and said, well, I'd pass on Cole because he's a Yankee now. What? They're either guilty or they're not guilty. They didn't get absolved because they were traded or, or signed as free agents. 
So all they have to do to be innocent is go to another team? That shows you how ridiculous this whole thing is and how arbitrary and capricious their justice is because they don't do anything to the people who are on their team. And some of the evidence is ridiculous. How about giving me, all right, Altuve, who I'm not, you know, listen, I'm the guy who's always been on the other side of the Altuve arguments, okay? Altuve stole the MVP. He stole the MVP, but he hit 200 points. His OPS was 200 points higher on the road than it was at home. It's a regular season award. He hit far better on the road than he did at home. What did he do? What evidence is there that he did something to win the MVP illegally when his numbers on the road were overwhelmingly higher than his numbers at home? How in a court of law would you prove that Altuve did something that would have aided his, unfairly aided his MVP run when he was better on the road by a wide margin than he was at home? His OPS at home was 834. His OPS on the road was 1,080. He hit 60 points higher on the road. So what did he gain by being home? Nothing. There has to be some semblance to this thing. It's gotten goofy. And here's where baseball has mishandled it. They mishandled it from the minute the Astros were told to apologize and did a terrible job. And they should have been involved in that. It should have been handled that day. And baseball now will not get past this for the, until opening day or past, past there unless they do the following. Unless Manfred, who has had to get up now and apologize for his own interview. And when you're a commissioner of a league and you have to get up for apologize for your own interview, then you are just really lousy at your job. Because if you have to apologize for your interviews, if you can't figure out what to say in public, and you have to go double down and, and apologize for your own interviews, you got a major problem. Because you're supposed to help things when you open your mouth, not make them worse. Number one, everybody believes, everybody believes that everybody inside the Astros knew this. We need verification of some kind or what baseball has that shows us that the owner did not know, number one. Number two, you need to prove to the best of your ability, whatever evidence baseball has at its side, that they did not do this in 2018 and 2019. And explain what you know. The mastermind was no longer with the Astros. He was with the Yankees. The manager who was part of it, the co a coach who was part of it was no longer there. He was the Red Sox manager. Is that enough reason for why it stopped? When did it stop? How did it stop? Who stopped it? That evidence has to be made public. Otherwise, no one's going to believe it ever stopped. And if you can prove to some order that they did not use electronic devices, what evidence do you have that makes it you confident they did not use any electronic devices last year? Because people still think they did. And these are players who still think they did. I'm not talking about media here. I'm talking about players have made all these accusations. That ownership knew. That they never stopped. And that they used electronic devices last year. If you know that didn't happen and you know they stopped after 17, explain how you know they stopped. Because we don't have any information that lends us, that gives us any information that makes anything believable to the public. The public and the, and the players here don't believe this investigation. They don't believe any part of it. But it's amazing how short-sighted the players are because the players have said, see, nothing was done. You have a general manager and three managers who lost their job, and to the players, that's nothing was done. Because they could care less about those guys' livelihoods. They could care less. They don't care if they got fired. They don't care what happened to Beltron. They don't care what happened to Cora. 
They don't care what happened to the general manager. They don't care about any of that. To them, nothing was done. Even though the guys who were in a position of authority were fired. They were suspended by baseball and fired by the owner. And then the other teams had to follow suit rather than employ these guys. And we still don't know what the Boston investigation is. But you can't make it, if you're the Yankees and you're whining, or you're the Dodgers and you're whining, you can't make it as convenient as, I'm just going to say that it's a fact and it's a fact. You've got to put forth some evidence. Explain to me how El Tuve cheated for the MVP. Give me some evidence. Because his play didn't show any evidence that that's true. And also, give some reason or some evidence as to why baseball thinks it stopped after 17. What you know that, what, give us some reason for that. We think that because of this. And what evidence you have that they did not do anything in 2019? Because players still believe it. But if you're a Yankee and you believe that, then how are you going to play behind Cole this year? Because you can't act like you're indignant about the fact that the Astros cheated last year and then act like it's okay that Cole's in front of you this year. It's not, you can't do that. It doesn't work that way. Cole's absolved because he came to the Yankees. That's not, that, that doesn't wash. Then you're not, then, then you don't have any real indignation because otherwise you want to see Cole punished too. He was part of the team. I don't care that he's a pitcher. He's also part of their team. So everyone uses this to their convenience. That's what they do. They use it to their convenience. Oh, it's okay. I'm okay with this. I'm okay with him. You know why? Because he's on my team. So I'm okay with that. It's as easy as that. Then it's all, it's all not true then all of, there's no real indignation if that's how easily it's solved. So if the guy gets traded to my team, now I'm cool with it. Okay. So if one of the Astro players gets traded to the Dodgers, then he's fine. He's a Dodger now. And the Yankees didn't have any information about last year when they had Beltron in their employ? If he was the mastermind in 17? How does that work? There had to be conversations there. All right, we'll take a quick break and get to come, uh, some other things. I want to get to some free agency with Albert Pierre because I'm tired of talking about the baseball thing. They still have a lot of work to do on that. One thing to mention, you've heard me talk about Jay Harwitz many times through the years, the wonderful longtime Mets uh, PR guy, the be- best PR guy in baseball, legendary guy. I mean, everyone loved him. Players loved him. Media loved him. Everyone loved Jay. You, if you didn't like Jay, you know, come on. Really, how could you not like Jay? He was the nicest guy. He bent over backwards for everybody. He's got a book coming out. Now, he's not, if you're looking for dirt, if you know Jay, he's not going to dish any dirt on anybody, even the guys he didn't like over 50 years, and there was a couple, but I'm not going to say who they are. But he has a book called Mr. Met. Mr. Met. It's available now at Amazon.com. DeGrom did the forward. It comes out March 10th. It's on sale right now, though. You can buy it right now at Amazon.com. He'll do an interview with me the week of when the book comes out. It's 50 years of his anecdotes of being around the Mets for 50 years. So, like I said, if you're looking for him to tell you, you know, a great scandal, that's not going to happen. You know that. But he's got wonderful anecdotes about what happened, I'm sure. I haven't read the book yet. I haven't seen the book yet. But uh, I know it's for sale right now at Amazon.com. Go to Amazon.com. Mr. Met J. Harwitz's book. And you know what I thought of today before I take a break and get to Albert Breer on the free agency? You know, Matt Harvey isn't in baseball this year. And I, lo- I-, I was thinking yesterday about Matt Harvey for some reason. I don't know why. And then I said, let me see what team he's on. I looked at the Angels. He wasn't there. I said, oh, maybe he's at Texas. Look at the Texas. He wasn't there. Look at the Reds. He wasn't there. I said, you're telling me Matt Harvey's not. And then I looked and said, Matt Harvey's not in a major league camp. 
he's free agent. He can sign anywhere he wants, but he can't get a job. And when I think back to the Matt Harvey I saw, I was sitting right there in the first row of the night he pitched the All-Star game. I was sitting right there the night he pitched that incredible classic game and went out for the ninth inning and jumped on the mound. The game that could have changed his whole legacy in New York and how brilliant he was for eight innings that night and how wondrous this guy's talent was. He had, a, he had, he had talent like Siva. He really did. It just shows you how hard it is to be good over a long period of time. Talent isn't enough. It takes luck, and he had two severe injuries. It also takes a lot of the things that he didn't have. But, boy, think about a career that could have been. Think about how amazing we thought Matt Harvey was going to be and should have been. And now he's not even in baseball. Wow. Nobody probably more stunned by that than Matt Harvey. Back after this. I want to get away from the sign stealing stuff because I just can't talk about it anymore. Uh, so I was thinking, you know what? It's a good day just to kind of get a thought on free agency in the NFL and where these guys are going to go. I think the last time we talked to him was a couple of games with days before the uh, Super Bowl. And Albert joins us now. Albert, Bria. Albert, welcome. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm happy to get your, uh, your mind off the ass. You know, I, 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 baseball. yes, I have, you know, even LeBron James check, you know, you know, it's time to get off it when LeBron James checks in on, uh, on, on the baseball yeah. scandal. Um, I, I took my boys to the game. I'm sitting there with, I'm sitting with Julio, who's a, the biggest, craziest, unbelievable Niner fan in the world. Yeah. And my son Harrison is, uh, and he's playing Xbox in the next room. He's uh, a huge Chief fan and has been for years now. So he, he's he's uh, 14, but he's a huge Chiefs fan. And uh, we're sitting in the, and I'm and he's sitting down in front of me with my other son Jack and we're sitting with me and we're right in the middle of the Niner country and it's like we're sitting on a 45 yard line and the Niners are winning. Mm -hmm. and they send the ball back, and I said to them, I said, this, you know, I said, this is it. I said, you get the ball back here, and the game's over. And yep. that's when Mahomes makes the play to Hill, which wasn't the best thrown pass because it was a duck. It was up there forever, and Hill was right. wide open. But, he, made, but he, he got away from the pass rush, which was, I thought, the theme yep. of the game because he could have been sacked 10 times. They, they got so much pressure on him. If he hadn't been mm -hmm. so adept with his feet, he could have, a normal quarterback, a mortal quarterback could have been sacked 10 times in that game. A Manning would have been sacked 10 yep. times, okay? That's how good he was with his feet. But that play, and then when they, got, they scored after that and got the ball back, and he walked out on the field, I turned to Julio and said, Julio, I don't know what's going to happen in the final two minutes, but you're going to be losing in about three minutes. I said, after they had <laughs> scored once, I, I just felt it. I just felt it. I never had a doubt yep. on that second drive. And that second drive when he came in, when he wound up uh, beating, uh, beating Sanders with, uh, with what you call it, with the um, – uh, you know, uh, when he got, when he, when he had hit the 34 yarders, oh, yeah, when he had, yeah. when he hit the 34 yarder, uh, yep. to, you know, for that play, um, he was five for five on that drive. He was so in control on that drive. He was so good on that drive and forget the last score. Cause it was, you know, it was, it was meaningless, but that drive will stick with me for a long time. It was almost yeah. Montana-like, Brady-like. It was that brilliant uh, how good he was on that drive. And that pass was so perfectly thrown, uh, you know, that it was, uh, you know, you couldn't have thrown it better. He was precision on that drive on every play. And it was a great finish to the game. It really was. I mean, two good teams. Yeah. I, you know, listen, Garoppolo didn't play oh. well in the fourth quarter. We know that. Uh, but San Francisco was an inch away from putting that game away with their pass rush. I'll tell you what. Like, if I'm – well, first of all, you're right about the pass rush. I mean, I, I think if you take the, the whole of the four quarters, Nick Bosa might have been the best player on the field in the Super Bowl. Uh, and, you know, DeForest Buckner wasn't far behind him. So they – 
uh, the Niners, I mean, they were who they've been all year. And that's what's amazing about it is, you know, you had a Niner defense that was second in the league in total defense that had the most fearsome, you know, front four in football. And they were everybody, they, they were everything that they've been all year. And he was still able to beat that. Yep. <laughs> you know? Yep. I mean, and, it, and he wasn't great all game, but his ability right. to get away. And, well, you know, and, and, his, and, and when he hits. And here's the thing. When, when he here, hits Sammy Watkins for that play, I mean, that is. that. Uh, well, and he, that pass was so perfect, it was unbelievable. The, the you know the hill play. If he could get the hill play out there earlier, he'll score. He'll he'll walks into the end zone. He walks into the end zone. He had to wait. Right. He had to wait forever for that ball. But the fact that he even got the ball off, I mean, Bruckner had him. He had him dead on that play. He had him by the arm. It was unbelievable that he got away from it. Yep, yep. And, and you know, it's <laughs> the funny thing is like Mahomes going to a contract negotiation. You know, what's your position for the Chiefs? Like. <laughs> don't make it hurt too hard, you know. Like I. Well, the question it, is, how much does he want to impact his own team in terms of? Right. Even though the salary cap is probably going to be up around what two hundred two million or somewhere or somewhere around there. Yeah, I mean, I would think he'd probably get around forty a year. And look, I mean, under the new CBA, that's going to be workable. So um, you, know, you do whatever you do what you got to do. You know that you do what you got to do to keep. Hey, up. he's that good. Um, he I mean, is. He is legitimately yeah. that good. He's Montana like. He's he's that good. He is if he stays healthy, he's going to be an all time great. And look what he's already accomplished. Mm-hmm. And he reminded me of Montana at the end yeah. of the game. And his coolness when he walked back out there. And he had been frustrated during this game. He had thrown some bad passes during this game. Uh, you know, he had really thrown the ball late a couple of times. He had made some bad throws. Uh, he had had a run for his life. But on that last drive, he was like. Guys, this is what I was born for. And it was almost like yep. there was a calmness over him on that drive where everything was absolutely perfect right into the end zone. Yeah, and, you know, a couple of things I, I, I like here. Number one, um, to me, there are very few quarterbacks that can take the sort of beating that he took in the first half and really through three quarters and be able to sort of put their foot in the ground and change momentum that way. Yep. Um, you know, normally when a guy gets knocked around like that, and you know this, Mike. They get punched drunk. They start doing things that they normally wouldn't do. They start to play outside of themselves. And you know, you normally, especially the young player, they'll see panic sometimes. Like they'll start to see things that aren't there. They'll start to take chances they wouldn't normally take. And he and he never let the game get away from him. And that has nothing to do with his athleticism or his arm. But that's just something inside of him, you know. And so the ability to do that, I like honestly, like. That it would have reminded me of was Brady against Seattle in the Super Bowl, um, you know, five years ago, and sort of how Brady was able to compartmentalize what happened first two and a half quarters against the Seahawks. They really, you know, beat him up, and you know was able to sort of turn things around in the fourth quarter. It was like that, and so I think having that quality on top of everything else the kid has is. Incredibly, yeah, r- r- wonderful, incredibly important. wonderful performance, and, and uh, right. really, and I tell you, the thing, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on the game, but the thing was, you know, everyone's on, and rightly so, let's be honest, uh, the Niners, again, from a standpoint of play calling and sideline management, didn't have a great game. I mean, we know that, okay? They, right. they, but the third and five play. Okay, he should have thrown it on. He should have run it on second down after he got five on first down. We know that they were averaging almost seven yards a carry. He he should have run it there. He didn't. But on third down, he has Kittle so open, so yeah. open. I yeah. mean that yeah. he could have run. He would have run at least twenty five yards. He might have run for a touchdown. I mean, he definitely would have cut it up and gone for at least twenty five yards, maybe more. And that is at twenty seventeen. And at that point. You know they they could control the clock and the game, and they're gonna they're gonna now march it inside three minutes just by running the ball on the next couple of plays, and that's the one that's gotta just kill Garoppolo. Yeah, he missed the touchdown to Sanders. He had him on the double. He had double covered. He had him on the deep post. He overthrew him. He read it. He read yeah. it. He read it when he was still covered because I saw when he threw it because I was watching it. I saw everything in front of me, and he read it when he was still covered. He just overthrew him. But the third and five. Kittle was so open. He's probably hit that play yeah. a thousand times this year. And and he yeah. didn't go to Kittle, which is the amazing thing. He goes elsewhere with the ball, which has to be just befuddling to which the coaching is, staff, you know? And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you what, too, Mike. I mean, I, I think we got to give Steve Stagnola some credit here because one of the things when I saw your about this after the game, um, 
they really, one of their adjustments after halftime, they clamped down on, on Kittle. Uh, in particular, it was because of the play he made at the end of the half, right? Yep. And so they were they were doubling him a lot in the second half, a lot more than they had in the first half. And they did some in the first half. But, you know, I, I think part of that play, and this is sort of like an inside-the-game type thing, like details and everything else, but I think one of the reasons, and, and Garoppolo had the answer to this himself, but I think one of the reasons Garoppolo didn't look to Kittle was because, you know, for most of the half. They've been taking him away. Yeah. Is it a scheme adjustment? And yep. so, you know, for Stags to do that and then come back and throw something else at him in that spot, so he's not looking at Kittle when Kittle's not covered. Yep. I mean, it's just. And that's me, where, like, that's you know, it, it reminded me so much of the year before being at the game. And all day they had doubled Gronkowski. And the one yeah. play they didn't double Gronkowski, he hits him and he hits the big play to Gronkowski, takes it all the way down the field, and that turns out to be the game-breaker. And that just shows you the veteran quarterback. He waited all day. And remember, that day, Brady had looked terrible because he was 0 for 7. He was 0 for 8 throwing deep to Hogan that day. 0 for 8 trying to get the ball to Hogan down the field. And he couldn't get the ball to his tight end because they took Gronk away. But the one play, they didn't double him. And I saw it out of the huddle. I said, man, he's not doubled. And I was like, whoa, and he got him the ball, and that just shows you the difference. And But Mahomes' judgment in the fourth quarter went to a different level, and I, I tell right. you, I could not well, be more impressed by a quarterback and, than I was by him in that game. And, you know, it, it's like even like on the throw, and the throw wasn't great, right? Like the throw didn't hit him inside, but if you, if you watch the play, all right, like and if you really break it down, and they ran a counterpoint to this play earlier in the game, um, where instead of going outside, Tyree Kell went inside, and instead yep. of um, instead of Kelsey you know, stopping, so he he tossed. And so you know the Niners had seen this earlier in the in the game, and the Chiefs were trying to get them to bite on something they'd seen earlier in the game. And sure enough, you know Mahomes read it, and like so, you know Mahomes watching the play from you know, from his perspective back there, he sees the corner latch on to Sammy Watkins, who's running a deep dig. And then he sees the safety, Jimmy Ward, take two steps inside. And once he saw those two things, he knew there was a huge space. That was yeah, he had him from here. He had him field. from here. To, he had him from and, here to Canossi. I mean, again, it was unbelievable. That's a, that's, a, that's a mental thing, too, because that's, I know, like, like, all right, I'm processing this. I know I don't need the perfect throw. I know there's space there. I know I just got to put it up. Well, the amazing thing is he almost doesn't get the throw off. As you know, he's right. and you know the and at a nine land, as you know, the next day yep. they're saying Bosa was held on that play, held, as yep. as you yep. know, and they want a flag on the play. Bruckner almost gets him down anyway, and Bruckner said, "I thought Bruckner I had him it. down. I almost got him down." And he beat his guy right. all day. I mean, he beat his guy to a, like a drum all day. And and that was the crazy thing. That was the crazy thing. Is like Bruckner like. Like, for a guy to be able to keep – like, and, and any quarterback, I'll tell you this, like, you get hit enough, like, you'll start looking at the rush, yep. right? Like, that's what happens. It's like, and so the fact that, 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 that Patrick Mahomes took the beating that he did all day, and they call this long-developing play, and he's dropping back whatever it was, 15 yards behind the line of scrimmage, and his eyes are still down the field, shows an incredible amount of toughness. Oh, so, great. I mean, a brilliant, a brilliant performance. Process, yeah. I don't think I people mean, realize how good the performance was. The way I said it walking out is I said, guys, if you had had an immobile quarterback there today, he would have gotten sacked 10 or 12 times. I mean, that's how many times. I can't tell you how many times he got away and just broke the line of scrimmage and got five yards, got six yards, got a run. I mean, they had him. They crushed the pocket on almost every pass play. It was unbelievable how the pressure they were putting on him. They sacked him four times. They hurried him about 20 other times. It was amazing the pressure they put on him at, at the whole game. And he still was like that in the fourth quarter, which I, I thought was an, an incredible performance. All right, let's get to some uh, – as we get this point here, and this is going to be interesting. We know Breeze is going back now, okay? I mean, I'm sure he's been promised that he's going to be the starter, although I'm not sure he's going to be happy when, when the season progresses with Hill. But let's see what happens. That'll make Bridgewater become a free agent. you got so many quarterbacks as free agents. It's going to make for a fascinating uh, – yep. obviously, there's one story until there's no story, and that, of course, is Brady. Uh, but 
let's start there. Brady, any update, or do you th- would you change the percentages, or do you see anything different? What do you think's going on with Brady? Yeah. I don't, I don't believe the Cowboy I, stuff for a second. I'm sorry, I don't believe it for a no, second. I, I, no, I no, no, I, I mean, I, I feel pretty confident that Dak Prescott will be the quarterback for the Cowboys right. in 2020. Right. Um, whether or not they can work out a long term deal, we'll see. But I, at the very least, they franchise him, and he's on the team next year. Um, you know, I, I I think Brady is. I don't think Brady knows. Like, I don't think Brady knows where he's going to be in a month. If the, if the Pats give him the money, will he take it and just quietly go back to New England? I think it sort of depends on things outside of just that. Like, I think it sort of depends on, all right, like, you know, are you, how, I have a team to be set up. Like, what are, who are my receivers going to be? How is, who am I going to be throwing to? Like, what's going to be asked of me? Like, are you going to go all in with, you know, some of the guys that you've had here? Uh, you know, are you willing to push salary cap space in, into the future to, to, to win right now? Like, I, I think a lot of it's going to boil down to if Brady thinks he's being put in a position to win. Now, the advantage the Patriots have that I don't think anybody's talking enough about is they have an offense in place that he's run for his entire career. It's really his offense. It's not even Josh's, Josh's offense or Bill's offense. It's his offense, right? So they've got an offense in place that's his offense. They've got coaches that he's been around for 20 years. Um, and I think going somewhere else would sort of, you know, I mean, be jarring to some degree for him. And, you know, you'd have a lot of questions just scheme-wise and, you know, operationally, like, like you know, okay, like how are we going to make this work? Yeah, I see. I don't, I don't think he has a comfort level. Off. I don't think he has a comfort level anywhere else except possibly Tennessee because of right. Rabel. Because of Rabel, I, right. I don't think he's going near the Chargers from what I understand. And and I don't yeah. think he's going to the Raiders. Well, I never thought he's going to the Cowboys. I think he's going to Tennessee or to New England. So the Chargers, so I would say the Chargers would have to convince him we're going to go sign an offensive lineman or two because their offensive line's a mess. So they'd have to convince them that, like, okay, like, we're going to bring in some offensive line help so you're not going to get, you know, the you-know-what knocked out of you. Yep. And we're going to study and install a version of your offense. Like, I think that's what it would take. Yep. Um, the Raiders, I think it would just, you know, it would have, like, you, like him and, and Gruden would have to find a middle ground on the way the offense is going to be run. Um, and I don't know if Gruden would do that. I, with, with Vrabel in Tennessee, I just think that, that one's, particularly fascinating because so many elements in place. Oh, you got and, a you got a running I mean, back who takes all the pressure off him. Right. And you've got a defense you can win with. They were in the AFC. Right. They need a pass rusher. Year. Listen, if they had Brady, all they need is a pass rusher and a cornerback and then they can go play the Chiefs. They've got first round picks at each tackle spot. Right. <laughs> you know, like like guys who are drafted. Right, they need – listen, they need round. a pass rush. They don't have any pass rush. They need a pass rusher, right. and, and, and they need somebody to play and a little better got, in the secondary. They've got some elements of, They've got some elements there, Jarrell Casey and, and Harold Landry, who – I mean, like, look, they're, they're, I, I just don't think they're very far off. And I think Mike well, – I think Mike can appeal to Tom. Like, hey, let's go show Bill together. You know what I mean? Yeah, right? I think that – listen, I think that, I think that makes close. plenty of sense. I think other than New England – and I expect him to go back to New England. We're talking with Albert Breer. I expect him to go back to New England. But if he doesn't, I would think the only place he goes is Tennessee because, he, first of all, he and Vrabel are very close. Um, yeah. uh, and they're closer even than I even realized because I talked to someone who was there with them all these years, and they said he and Vrabel are really close. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, yes. Yeah, so, I uh, and Vrabel – uh, you know, wants to be the next big coach. And uh, Tennessee, would, w- with the pieces in place, he's not going to get touched there next year. And it, it, right. he's got to be thrilled to throw on play action where he's going to, you know, Tom Brady yeah. on play action is going to be unbelievable. So, well, you know. And I think there are a couple of things, too. Like, like I, I, beyond just, you know, what you mentioned, they've got a really, really sharp second-year offensive coordinator now. Arthur Smith did a really nice job his first year. Um, but it's not like he's been entrenched in a system for the last 20 years. He's worked in a lot of different systems. So at least on paper, you would think he'd have the flexibility to sort of build things the way t- Brady sees fit. Um, the other thing is I, Brady's going to settle his family in the New York area. Right, because of Jack. Being able, to go, being able to go back and forth in New York on your off day, I think would really appeal to him. You can do that in private playing from Nashville. Yep. I'm not sure, so sure you'd be wanting to do that from Vegas. That's a good point. No, it's a, it's a fair you know, point. So uh, I absolutely. That, I, I, I think the, uh, there's a family element there. So, look, I mean, I still think, like, ultimately, we're going to – I think the Crafts are going to make a, a, a compelling pitch to keep Brady. 
Um, I, I think that the Patriots are, are, are going to you know, do something reasonable um, with him. I don't know if they're going to blow him away, but I think they'll do so. They'll, they'll come up with something. Too many smart people in that building. They'll come up with something reasonable. I think it's going to have to happen soon. Um, and I think the one thing that's instructive here, if you want to look at timing, um, the last two extensions, the last two real extensions that Brady did uh, were in 2013, 2016. Both those were done right around the com- combine. One was done in late February. The other was done in early March. And a lot of the work was done right around the combine. And that makes sense, too, because most teams are doing all their strategy and their planning and all that different stuff ahead of the combine. And so that's when the Patriots will be putting their plans in place. And so, I, you know, I think when we all get to Indy next week, that's when things, you know, start to crystallize for Brady with the Patriots. And, you know, of course, you know, as you know, um, despite what the tampering rules say, everybody's talking to everybody in Indianapolis. Right. And so I think Brady will also have an idea of where the interest is from outside, too. Fascinating. It really is. And I think Prescott, go, I, don't, I never bought this Dallas stuff. I do think, though, that no. if he doesn't go, and I don't, know, I don't know if he goes to New England or not. I don't know. I still think he does. But if he doesn't, I think Tennessee could be fascinating. And then that puts Tannehill back on the market. So we have to wait to, for him. But how about these other quarterbacks? Jameis Winston, Phillip Rivers. Uh, is Winston staying in Tampa? Does, does uh, Rivers go to Tampa? Does River goes, Rivers go to Indianapolis? Uh, what do you think? Let's yeah. ta- what do you think? Let's take so, River. What take, let, let, wait, before we get to them, let's start with the Niners because the Niners, if I'm coming off the Super Bowl, that team's loaded. I'm not giving yeah. up on Garoppolo despite what people think. I think they're wrong. Don't give up on Garoppolo. Yeah, he had a bad no. game, but don't give up on him. Uh, the one thing I'd say, though, is Sherman gets beat like a drum in that game. Um, I don't like their corners. I got to upgrade my corner positions if I'm them. Uh, Sherman's getting old, and I got to upgrade the corner. The only place I'm weak at all in that team is on the uh, is on the corner. I think Sherman can still play. Um, I just think he needs to be managed a certain way. And and look, like within the confines of that defense, you can do it. You know, I think they looked at the draft. Um, you know, to try to shore up the corner spot a little bit because I do agree they need some help there. Um, you know, I I think they're really to me, Mike. One of the big things is going to be just internally what they do with some of their guys for up. You know, I don't so, think people realize they got beat, but a team like them should – that's why Mahomes was that good and Andy's offense was that good because that team, with the way – that the numbers that team brought into the Super Bowl, it's supposed to win the Super Bowl, that team. It's a, right. Now, I picked so, Mahomes because I was on Kansas City all year, but I thought San Francisco was the better team except the quarterback, and I thought maybe the quarterback – and I picked the Chiefs, but I was hoping the quarterback would do what he did in the fourth quarter – I knew San Francisco was better at the line of scrimmage both ways than they were. And San Francisco is loaded right now as a team. They are absolutely loaded. No question. And, and so what's going to be interesting is like a couple of spots where they've got guys internally who are up that they're going to have to make decisions on. One's Eric Armstead, who probably the third best player on their defensive line, but really broke through in 2019. And so, you know, I, I think they probably lose him because they're going to have to pay DeForest Buckner, and I, I don't know if he can pay both. Um, you know, so he's one that's a pretty big piece where you say, okay, like now you're taking a piece out of what was the team. Oh, so, you, so you, you, of- you keep Buckner, you let Armstead walk. Obviously, Bosa's a force. Uh, right. You got, you got Alexander and Warner and all those guys back, and you just got to get a little better in the yeah. secondary. Right, and then and that's the other thing is that Jimmy Ward. So, like, both Armstead and Jimmy Ward, they were first-round picks for the Niners, and both were sort of slow to develop, but both had huge years this year. And so, like, losing those two guys is going to be it's going to be an issue in different ways. Like you said, like, the depth in the secondary is a little bit of a question. So, if you lose your starting free safety... No, Ward's good. Ward, no, I, I just don't like the corners. I don't like the corners. I don't like the corners. And yeah. I think Sherman's getting yeah. old. But listen, Sherman can still play, and, they, and Sherman actually... Believe it or not, I was shocked. He played a lot of man in that game, which surprised me. He played a lot more than I thought he would. And they played hill man a lot, but they played soft on him. They gave him a huge cushion, and then they finally started throwing in front of him. And they Because he played him with a look that usually there wasn't a safety over the top, but they played him way soft on the corner is what they did. And they kept throwing yeah. the ball in front of him is what they kept doing, you know? And I'll tell you, and I'll tell you what, like that, I don't mind that strategy because, I mean, it's, if you're going up against a team that can score as quickly as the Chiefs can, um, 
I can understand where it's like, okay, like make them work the ball down the field, make them go 12 plays. You know what I mean? Like, yep. let's see if they can do it and don't let them score in three plays. Like I, that was a big part of their strategy. And I, and I think the Niners would argue, I mean, look, like, and you mentioned the corners, right? So Emmanuel Mosley was the guy in coverage on the Tyreek Hill play. If, you know, if he falls off, which is what he's supposed to do on that play, right? If he falls off, then he's going back to the corner of the field and he's got Hill covered. The fact that he latched on to, 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 to Sammy Watkins, that winds up opening things up for Tyree Kill on the flag. But, like, it's just – it's one of those things where if you look at the Niners, uh, what they did defensively over the course of the first three quarters – if they get the stop there, Mike, I don't know. If, I don't know if the Chiefs come back. No, listen. You know, no, if like, they if they get the stop there, they win the game. They 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 right. they win so, the game. I thought I, I thought they absolutely win the game if that's the case. They needed that that play just, had to happen for them to win the game. And it's just interesting, just because you look at it, and it's like that one little thing, and like it's such a well played game by the Niners overall, and that one little thing was like the spark that the Chiefs needed, and then all of a sudden you got a different Mahomes in the fourth quarter. So yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, I like it's just it was such a I mean, like from a talent standpoint, it was just like you said, the Niners probably have a more talented roster end to end, and you know you see how you know a, a truly, truly great quarterback can just right, and, and they have a lot of weapons. And Andy had a good game. I mean, Andy was ready. What I liked what Andy was is that he was very ready with his fourth down plays. He was very decisive yep. with his fourth down plays. He was ve- and Andy was ready for the game. He had his plays that he wanted to run. He knew what he was wanting to run. He's cool under pressure. And they broke down a little when they when you know when they had to make plays. They broke down and they went away. That where they where they needed to just show that they could do. Like if you had said to them before the game. It's going to be 2017 with five minutes left. I'm going to give you the ball. Can you run the ball for three first downs? They would have said, night and day we can run the ball for three first downs. They come down. They get the ball. Right. There's five minutes left. They give it to one on first down. They get five yards. So you say, okay, second and five. They went to the pass play on second and five, and they could probably say, hey, it was a safe throw. No, it wasn't. It was a mistake because you're averaging – you had very few negative runs all day. You basically yeah. were able to run the ball all day on them. You averaged almost seven yards of carry on them. You got to run the ball there on second down, work the clock, and then put the ball in the air on third down. It, you know, it, it, instead he throws it, and now it's third down. If I remember right, in the second down play, it got tipped at the line of scrimmage, if I remember right. It got tipped right off the line of scrimmage. And then on the third down, he hits. He has Kittle for the first down. He misses him, and he goes elsewhere, and they get the ball back. They, I mean, if, if you had said to the Chiefs, 2017, five minutes left, I'm gi- I mean, to the Niners, five minutes left, I'm giving you the ball back. Where's your four minute game? They would have said, "Hey, we were born for this. This is what no we question. right." And they they got that, and they they basically threw it threw it away. Yeah, and it's it's um, you know, I I, I think, and, and I know people are going to kill the Niners for it, and, it, and it's like I, I think like I don't honestly like, I have more of a problem with the way that they call plays at the end of the first at the end of the second half, the end of the first half. Like, I thought the end of the first half that was a mistake. Sort of I didn't part. understand that I, at I all. Think, I didn't I understand like that. I, I mean, like, like the, I, I understand what Kyle was doing there, and the point was to sort of limit possession, and I get that. In the second half, I felt like at the end of the game, they sort of got away from where who they were when they the, the minute they got to a bad down situation. When they got into that second and nine, they sort of said, "Okay, like we're going to change who we are." And I and I had a little bit of an issue with that. Like, so listen, they, I, they, you're like, right. They, listen, their play calling it, it was right. I think that there's two there's two things I don't like that they did in the game on, on Shanahan. Number one. I don't agree. When you're going to get the ball back, the Chiefs get, tr- try to screen on third down. Now you got you call time out there. You're going to get the ball back at a minute 45. And you know what? If they punch to the two yard line, then you get out of there. But you know what? They didn't. You got to try and you got to you can't you can't play that. Let them run the clock down to 55 and then decide with 20 seconds left. Now we're going to attack. I mean that doesn't make any sense. I mean uh, so I didn't like that. And then the second down play on that drive where at 27. Team. To me, that's yeah. when they went away from who they were. Because if they get one first down there, or they get the third and one, you know, on third and one they're going to get the first down. They they were getting they were getting yardage all day. The Chiefs were not right. able to stop them from getting a couple of yards on plays. So I don't think they could have stopped them on a third and one. And I think if they had run it two more times, it would have changed that game completely. And they got five on yeah. first down, which was what are you doing? 
don't sometimes team out teams outthink themselves. You know that the good coach yeah. doesn't outthink himself in those spots, and he'll get better when he gets back and does it again. And you know, and and on the other side, Andy was decisive, and it's amazing that he even had a play for third and 15 because they were in trouble there. I mean, they were in big trouble and he did have a play for, as you said, he had a play for third and 15 that he was ready with a play that could work. And it did work. Yeah. Well, and and I think it's one thing to his players in that spot too. I mean, Mahomes is part of that discussion. And so, you know, I think it's like, it's, it's also like the good sense knowing when, all right, like I'm going to listen to like my guys now and I'm going to like, they're the ones out there playing the game. Whatever they're comfortable with, they're seeing it in a different way than I am. So whatever they're comfortable with, as long as you know it fits into what we're doing, let's just do it. You know, and so I think that there's that part of it too. I, I thought like this, I, like just end to end, um, you know, just like magnificent by Andy Reid in the way that like his team was resilient. They didn't stray from the plan, um, and I think you can go all the way back to the off season too. Like making some of the tough decisions that they made, moving on from D Ford, Justin Houston, bringing in Frank Clark, moving on from Bob Sutton, bringing in Steve Spagnolo. I mean, really, Mike, the difference between this year's team and last year's team wasn't the offense. It was last year's team couldn't get a stop in the AFC Championship game against the Patriots. No, no right? question. No like, question. When I mean, that team needed a stop, they could not get a no, stop. No, Spags like, did a good job. He, it, listen, they, he did a good job. He really did. Uh, he he at least kept yeah. them off balance. It wasn't easy, but he kept them off balance. And I thought the Chiefs made some good plays defensively. I thought they really did. I, I well, thought they. Uh, I, I thought the. I thought uh, the Honey Badger played really well. I thought he did a good yep. job. I thought he was used well, and I thought he did a good job. I thought a couple of their guys had really active games and did a good job. I thought I thought three or four of the Chiefs defenders had good games. Yep, and I and I think it's you know I, well I mean Honey Badger's won you know Frank Clark making a big play at the end chasing Garoppolo out of bounds. Uh, you know it's just again like I, I you know you, last year the defense had players like there were some guys you know you recognize their names and everything else. It, it, this year, it felt like that there was just a coherent plan in the way it was put together. And, you know, at, at the end of the game, as good as Mahomes was, all that doesn't happen if you can't make stops. And No, they had to get the stop at 2017. You're absolutely right. right. They got him the ball back in three plays, and that was critical. And when they did, that's yeah. when I turned to Julio and said, Julio, you know what, they're going in the end zone. Because, you know, yeah, that's it. I mean, yeah, I said, and, you know, I turned to him and I said to him, when they got the ball back in 2017, I said, this is the drive for your championship right here. I said, this is it right here as you drive. And, you know, I was sitting around a lot of Niner fans because they were right in our section. They were all Niner fans. And they thought they had the game won. They were starting to celebrate on the when, when it was third and 15 on that play. Right before that, they started celebrating. They were getting really cocky. And, and you could tell. Uh, and they, they thought, and then all of a sudden he hits that big play. And then, you know, two plays later, they're in the end zone on the uh, pass interference. So, uh, you know, so uh, now you're down the goal line, and now it's all a different game. But it came down. They got the drive that we wondered if they could get. You know, we talked about it. Could they get the four-minute drive that they had to have? They were built for that. They didn't do it. And then Mahomes, could he answer? He answers. And then can Garoppolo answer? And, you know, Garoppolo comes within a foot and a half of of scoring again. I mean, let's be honest. He almost hit that pass play. On on the deep post, he almost hit the pass Standard, play. Yeah, you know, uh, it was a great game. It really was. All right, a couple things more on these free agents with Albert Breer. Here we go. Uh, Rivers, where, what's your best shot on Rivers? I, I think he would like to go to Indianapolis or Tennessee. The question is going to be if there's interest there on the other end. I don't think Tennessee. I think Tennessee can't handle over going with Rivers. The Colts are an interesting one. Just because there's he's no buddies with Reich, there. right? He's buddies with Reich. Well, he's very close, not only Reich, but also Nick Sirianni, the offensive okay. coordinator. Those two guys were with him in San Diego. Right. And so they were part of like this brain trust that Mike McCoy put around Philip Rivers. Um, and so, like, a lot of like building that offense in San Diego, a lot of that was Rivers and Reich and Sirianni. And so there's a great rapport there. And I know Rivers would love to play for him again. Um, and play for them again. We'll see whether or not it happens. I think they'll sort of boil down to their internal evaluation of Jacoby Brissett and how they feel about their chance of getting one of the top quarterbacks in the draft. But, um, you know, he would make sense for them as a stopgap. So I think the Colts would probably be the one team that I would look at. 
if they have an interest in Rivers, I think Rivers would have an interest. In that. Do you think Winston keeps his job in Tampa? You know, this one's interesting because I I, I know Bruce Arians really likes him personally. It just sounds to me like contract talks didn't get off to a good start, and so this is going to be a matter of getting that back on track. I, I think the best solution for everybody is probably to have Jameis back on a one-year deal. I don't think they're getting Brady. Uh, I, I'd be surprised um, if I, I like like I'd be surprised if it was Bridgewater. Rivers makes some sense for me there. I, I think Bruce Arians would make some sense for Philip Rivers. Uh, I so could see them together. I could I could see yeah. that I could see them together. What, so, where do you think Bridgewater winds up? He's got to vacate New Orleans now. Where do you think he winds up? Yeah, and Bridgewater is the interesting one just because I think his best shot is going to be being someone's bridge quarterback. You know, being the guy who gets a team to the next guy. Um, and so, you know, I, I could certainly see, uh, you know, a team like, and I, I just, you know, the Dolphins would be one, you know, if they were moving on from Rose, it doesn't look like they are. They've got maybe Fitzpatrick coming back. Um, he's a really, he's a difficult one to play. I mean, maybe Carolina, if they move on from Cam, um, maybe, you know, the Bears bring him in and the Bears have all kinds of cap issues now. Bring him in as a competitive piece, but I, no, I could see I could see Bridgewater in, in Chicago fighting for the job. I could see that if they gave him a chance to yeah. get the job, maybe that you know let let's see who wins the job. I, I could see that. That makes some sense. I I really like Teddy. I just it's, he's one that's just very difficult to place right now. Because you look at some of the situations, like all right, hey Teddy went team. undefeated last year, so he had a good year. I mean, he did. You know, he went right. in there no, and he, he definitely yeah. did. Yeah. He definitely did. It's just it's just difficult to find a natural landing spot for him. I mean. You know, like the Chargers, I don't know the Chargers would view him as a huge upgrade over Tyrod, and they've already got Tyrod under contract. Sounds like they like Tyrod okay. Taylor. They do, and they do, and I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you know the Chargers go into next year with Tyrod and the rookie. Like whether it's Herbert or Tua, who I know a couple like of that. coaches who like Tyrod. I'm not a big fan, but I know a couple of coaches who like Tyrod well, Taylor. And Anthony Lynn won with Tyrod too in Buffalo. Yep. So. Like, you know, they do have that. No, Anthony now. likes him. I know he likes Tyrod Taylor. Yeah. No, I know he does. Yeah, and, and so I think Anthony wants to do some things, uh, like, a little differently than they've done him, um, you know, utilizing his quarterback's life, so Tyrod works in that sense. And I do think, like, the, the fact that Tyrod's been through this before with a young quarterback, like, he was the placeholder for, for Baker in, in Cleveland in 2018. I think the fact that he had that experience helped, too. And it, it, if you're the Chargers, you say, okay, like who's going to be like good for a young quarterback to be around? The guy you have on your roster will be pretty good for that. All right, let me ask you about this quick too. The draft right now. Do you are you now of the prevailing thought before we go to the combines that we know what the one two is? We all know that. We know Washington's yeah. going to. We know what's going to happen. So the draft starts at three. Uh, yep. Lions. They keep Stafford. They trade Stafford. They draft Tua. They let somebody come up and draft Tua. Do you think Tua goes three? Do you think Tua goes four and he goes in, somebody trades into that sl- giant slot? Or do you think he goes five, the Dolphins? Uh, Herbert goes five. Do you think Tua now, because he, they gave him a, a pass on the hip, that he's okay? You yeah. think he goes now three to somebody? Well, we don't know. I mean, I, like, look, like so much of this is dependent on you know, when team doctors – well, let's say he's health. Let's say he comes off pretty healthy. He's, healthy. He, he, he's gonna healthy. go. He's probably gonna go three, yeah. right? I, if he's healthy, yeah, I think Detroit. Like now, I, I mean, I've been. You think that trades? You think there'd be a market for Stafford? Yeah, I mean, I, I I've been told by multiple people in the Lions organization that they're not trading Stafford. They're not so, trading Stafford. You know, Stafford's a good player. Stafford. He's a good player. Right. He's just had he's had horrific luck, like really bad luck, and so. I, you know, I think they stick, especially like if you look at the cap ramifications if they were to move on from them. The that 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 group they need to win now. Like so, are so you they gonna, keep Stafford. So they make they trade a package. Let somebody trade up to three for Tua. That's what I think. Like I I I think it's either you look at like a Jeff Okuda there who could replace Darius Lake corner, um, or I think more likely you know they put the tra- they put the pick on the block and they hope that you know Miami and the Chargers and. You know, all these teams that are down below them, like, really fall in love with Tua Tua or Herbert and gets desperate and, like, thinks, like, okay, like, we need to get up there to get them. If the Lions don't take them, then, I mean, I know the Giants, I know Gettleman's got no history of trading down. But then if the Lions were to pass them, then the Giants would have a hell of a market. The Giants have to to trade down and and let somebody take 
to uh, or to, who they got to well, take the picks and then and then well, build their team. They need that on right. defense. Plus, and they need it on the offensive line. They got plenty of people they could draft. They could draft on this uh, on the first. Yep. Uh, they got plenty and, of people to draft in those slots. Right, and, and the key is like this, a team that needs a quarterback now. The Giants can hold the key. Absolutely, to getting in front of Miami. And a- Miami absolutely, yeah, the, yeah. Especially since you. So you don't think you don't think Stafford's on the block at all. I like I like I, look. Here's what I would tell you. I know last year they took the tires and some of the quarterbacks in the draft. Um, my sense was they really like Daniel Jones, um, and I don't know what would have happened if Daniel Jones had been available to, to them at eight. Um, I do not get the sense that they're moving on from Matt Stafford right now. Okay. Um, and I think there are multiple reasons why. I mean, and, and look, like one of them's obvious. One of them, I, those guys were, you know, had their job on jobs on the line. And, and let's be honest, Patricia's getting fired if they don't win this year. There's no question. Yeah, like, and, and so are you going to put all your eggs in the basket of Can't. Tua where you don't know if his hip's going to be – you don't know what he's going to be like in year one, you know, physically, because you're not going to be able to see him at 100% before the draft. I think you've got to so, figure he needs a year. You, I think you have to yeah. figure – even if you love him, and everyone should love right. him, he's that good, but I think you've got to figure he needs a year. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah. And so I, I think that's, that's the thing. So I think the Lions – Either, you know, they, they sit. I mean, look, like if Chase Young were to somehow put them at three. He won't happen. I, I He's the, going to. I mean, they've already yeah. committed the to him at two. To, the, the Lions would sprint the car up to the, up to the stage. I, like, I don't think that's happening. So, no, he's going you know, I, to. I, he, he's yeah. going to. I don't think there's any question. But it looks like Herbert's up to five now, right? It looks like he's that high. Well, and Herbert, yeah. So this is, and this is the way it works every year, right? Like right. The, the quarterbacks like, always go high see. anyway, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's like we talk about them like they're going to go 12 or 18 or Never happens. Or Never happens. And then they all wind up going in the top 10. Yep. Always the same. Listen, I, I, we got more to get to. I'll have you on again before the draft. I'll wait till after the uh, combine, but uh, we got a bunch more guys. It's gonna be you're gonna have a fascinating march. You really are. It's gonna be interesting. Oh, yeah. No question about it. All Thanks. Right. Appreciate it, Mike. Thank you. Albert Breer back after this. Mike's on. He's ready to go. On the fan. New York Sports Radio. Mike's on. Mike's on. He'll get you the sports any way that he can. It's Mike Francis on the fan. Sports Radio 66. All right, we come to you on this Wednesday evening uh, until 6.30, brought to you by Carlos Amigos Tequila, brought to you by those who drink it, as always, uh, on this Wednesday evening. One thing I wanted to mention is, uh, I forgot to mention yesterday, was that Jay Harwood has a new book out uh, called Mr. Met. You can get it at Amazon.com about his years as the Mets, you know, PR guy. He was there for five decades uh, as you all know, we love Jay. And I'll do an interview with Jay uh, when the book comes out. Uh, we'll schedule, you know, the book company wants to wait until, you know, uh, well, you know, they want to wait until the book's about to come out. You can buy it now in advance on Amazon.com, though. Uh, it's called Mr. Met, the forward by DeGrom, and it's about his 50 years. Now, you're not going to get any scandal in there because you know Jay. He loves the players. I mean, the players worship Jay. Jay worships the players. Jay would do anything for the players. I can't tell you. I can tell you that Jay, I swear, True story. Jay be like, Mike, uh, I need some tickets. Can I use your Yankee tickets? What do you need? Well, Mike got a player whose family's in town. They want to see the Yankees, and I can't get them any tickets. Can you, are you using your tickets? No, you can use them. I'm not going to tell you what player it was. But it was a big player. His family, his father used the tickets. I mean, that's Jay. Jay, whatever problem they had. Uh Broadway tickets, concert tickets, whatever whatever they needed, that was Jay. Whatever, no matter what the problem was, they went to Jay. And the players worshipped him, absolutely worshipped him. And the media did too. I mean, there's nobody in the media that doesn't like Jay. I mean, that's all there is to it. Uh, you have to be nuts not to like him. So uh, the book is Mr. Met, and it's you can get it at Amazon.com. I haven't gotten it yet, so I haven't seen it um, or read it. So uh, we will have him on. For, I told him whenever he wants to do an interview, we'll do it. So uh, Mr. Met is the book for you baseball fans if you want to get away from sign stealing. And Jay might even have something on sign stealing in there. Who knows? I'm not, I'm not sure. You know, But uh, maybe that's it because right now that's all you can do is talk about sign stealing. I can't tonight. I'm not in the mood. I just, 
the thing is just I just can't I can't talk about it anymore. I just can't. So let me give you a couple of things tonight. Number one, uh, I was just on Radio.com doing some stuff with uh, Albert about free agency, but we'll wait on that uh, for the NFL. Uh, but a um, couple things on. First of all, Beeline. He was a bad fit. Listen, when a college coach who's really good, and Beeline was a really good college coach. You know, for a long time he was underrated, but then people realized when he got a real good program. And he was annoyed, I know, by the recruiting process and by players leaving and just the whole thing with recruiting and everything else and with his son and all this stuff. And he just was fed up with it, so he went to the pros. And he probably shouldn't have gone to the pros at this age because it's not that you know, people say, oh, look, these college coaches, they, it just shows you how hard, yeah, they're not as good. It's not that they're not good. The college coaches can step in and win at the pro level if they have players. But when they step in, they usually step into bad teams. If you gave a great college coach a team with really good players, he'd win. Because if you gave a real ordinary NBA coach really good players, he'd win too. It's about the players in the pros. It's not about the the system will not win for you in college. You know, in college, you give Rick Pitino a team, he's going to string together 20 wins somehow, whether he's got talent or not. He's going he's gonna to come up with a system to get those guys to, to do something, play hard, be in better shape, you know, to, to out hustling, whatever. But he can't do that in the pros. It doesn't work that way. You win with talent in the pros. Players win in the pros, not coaches. Doesn't mean there aren't good coaches. There are good coaches. But players, players win in the pros. It's a pro. The, the NBA is a player-driven league. That's what it is. So if, don't be surprised by a college coach who goes to a bad team. But he didn't fit in. And it wasn't right for him from the beginning. And he wasn't happy. And now he's out. Now the question is, what happens to him? He's got money. He's 67. He could go home. Or is somebody going to get a good coach next year? And I think somebody's going to get a good coach next year. I don't think he's going to leave. But I don't know that yet. I haven't talked to him. Maybe we'll get him on when the smoke clears. Um, I like Beeline a lot. He's a really good offensive coach, one of the better offensive coaches in the country. Did a really good job at Michigan. Did a really good job before Michigan. Um, BC might need a coach. He'd be really good there. Uh, Texas might move on from Shaka Smart. If they did, he'd be really good there. Um, I don't want to start listing other teams, but there's a lot of places where he'd be right at the top of the line, as you know. You know, So rather than list 100, 100 jobs, why bother? Um, Seton Hall tonight. Playing Butler at home. A couple, of be- a couple of weeks back, Seton Hall was rolling. They had a three-game lead in the Big East. People were picking them to go to the Final Four. Some people were even picking them to win the championship. There were a lot of people on that bandwagon. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, things have gone a little haywire. Now you got them playing Butler tonight. Butler hasn't been playing well. But Seton Hall now has a one-game lead. And they got a one-game lead over Creighton, which is right now playing the best in the whole Big East, and they got one game lead over Villanova. And after tonight, Seton Hall's got to play St. John's on Sunday in the Rock. And then they have – still they finish up. When they do finish up the, the conference, they finish up with Villanova at home and then Creighton on the road. Those are their last two games. Villanova at home, Creighton on the road. And those are the teams that are right behind them. And right now, you know, Villanova knows how to win these things. And Creighton right now is playing the best. They won at Marquette last night. They're playing the best ball in the entire league right now. So this is a big game for Seton Hall. They need to get back on track here. And Willard was pretty outspoken about his team, saying he's going to cut the rotation, which it should anyway. Tends too deep a rotation. With the way college game is now in the NCAA tournament, you don't need more than seven players. Eight, more than enough. Any more than eight's too many. Because the way the timeouts are set up, you don't need it. Other than foul trouble, you don't need extra players. Because the timeouts, you get too much rest. So eight-man teams are optimum. Seven's even fine. 
So cutting the rotation is a good idea, but you heard him talk about guys not getting it, guys not hustling, guys not fitting in. Uh, to be this late in the season, in a very good season, and to had the year going they had going, and then to have a coach talking that way about his team in late February, that's alarming. This is a very big game for them tonight. They need to get back on track. They need to play like they're supposed to play. They've been a big-time defensive team all year. they got to go back to being who they were. Go back to be who they were a month ago before everybody was healthy and before they expanded the rotation. Go back to being who they were. Get everybody's head back in the game. Get everybody back the right way. Or decide now which guys you're going to basically not use if they're not fitting in. But this is a big time for them right now with Creighton and Villanova breathing down their neck. And right now, picking them right now to win a championship would be a foolhardy because right now they're struggling. Let's see what they do this evening. Back after this. There are a lot of loose ends in this baseball thing, as we know. Part of it is when you have guys who were Astros, depending which year, and then you're on your team, how do you deal with that? And the Yankees right now, you have multiple Yankees who have stated they think the Astros cheated last year. They think it didn't stop. They have stated on the record that they think they have cheated. Now, that means that you think Cole cheated because he was part of the team last year. Not only that, he was the star of the team last year. Now, it doesn't mean he was up hitting, but what, it was going on and he didn't know what was going on? So would you go down and ask Cole yourself if you think, if you stated publicly that you think the Astros cheated in 19, do you think you would walk down to his locker and say, hey, listen, let me ask you a question. I think you guys cheated this year. Tell me why I'm lying. Tell me that I'm wrong. And would you take his word for it? So here's how Cole addressed this today. We're all grown guys around here, and you know, I, uh, I certainly, I certainly am not going to tell somebody how to think. So um, I don't see it as an issue. Um, I'm not personally offended by it, and so I, hopefully that's the last question that I'll, I'll have to answer about it. Well, wait a second. How are you not personally offended by it if you have guys on this team who said you cheated last year? How are you not offended by it? So, wait a second. It's okay that they... Don't you think you should rectify this? Hey, I welcome aboard. Yeah, I'm going to play behind you all year. Yeah, we're teammates, but I think you cheated last year. I think you and your team cheated. You have multiple guys on the Yankees who have stated they think the Astros cheated last year. Then, if that's the case, how is Cole, who wants to just say, hey, I hope I don't have to answer this question again this year, and the Yankee... People don't want to bother Cole with this. I understand that. You don't want you want him to move on from this, but here's the problem. The Yankees are making assertions about last season. He was on the Astros. He was their star last season. It wasn't like he was on the moon. He was on the Astros. So we look at it as wait a second. You're gonna play behind this man. You're stating they cheated last year. Wouldn't you go down and just, or in a couple of, you know, some night hanging around or on the plane or something? Hey, let me ask you a question. I think you guys cheated last year. Am I right or wrong? And he's going to give you that. No, you know, listen, I never saw anything. Of course, nobody, Verlander never saw anything when he got there. Nobody ever saw anything. We all know that's a bunch of garbage. So here it is. Festering underneath the surface is the, just to show you how much nonsense there is in this is the f- thing that it's okay because we'll just leave it alone because we don't want to disrupt our team this year. But I'm saying the 19 Astros cheated, and my pitcher right here, my number one, my ace, he was an Astro last year. So I'm saying he cheated. So I got to go, if I'm there, I'm going to go to Cole and say, wait a second, Torres said he thinks you cheated last year. Do you have a problem with Torres saying that? No, I don't have a problem with Torres saying that. Well, did you or didn't you? See, that's where this thing turns stupid all the time. And that's why the fans don't get any certainty about anything. 
because baseball has left all this completely open-ended. You had Crane sit there and say, I know it ended after 17. When did it end? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? How do you know it ended if you don't know when it ended? And if the Yankees are going to make statements about the Astros for last year, wait a second. They had the guy in their employ who was the mastermind. What was he up to? Did you ask him? This thing's got so many loose ends, it's ridiculous. And the idea that you would, you would feign indignation about how upset you are. You have Yankee players talking about how upset they are that the Astros cheated. You don't have any problem that you just brought a guy in from the team. So that's okay now. He's he gets a pass because he's now a Yankee. Well, then you don't. Then you are. Then you. Then it's fake indignation. It's not real. You aren't really annoyed by it because you're not even. You're not going to take it up. If you really have a problem with it, you should take it up with Cole. He was there every day. That's where this gets crazy. You know, I, I've had it with the team. I've had it with that team. Except if they get traded to my team, then I'm fine with it. So you are calling your ace a cheater. If you are one of the Yankees who has stated, I think, and Yankees, multiple Yankees have stated they think the Astros cheated last year. You are calling your Star pitcher now, a cheater. He was a member, a prominent member of the Astros last year. You need to rectify that. John and Creskill starts us off. What's up, John? Hey, Mike. I I might have an answer for this. Let's drink these Astros before a house... Oh, stop. They're not going to get anywhere. John, that's not going to get anywhere. They're, they're not going to, you know, they're going to give the same answers they did before. You know, that's going to be it. We're sorry. We did it in 17. We didn't do it after that. Listen, Congress, it, it, it not, Congress doesn't get any answers. We know that. They're not going to get any answers. They're just going to put on a grandstand play. That's all. Yeah, but Mike, you know, MLB is powerless. The union is afraid to do anything. Well, John, the union doesn't want to do anything. The union is protect. But here's the thing. Baseball wasn't powerless. They suspended the manager and the general manager for the year. They lost their jobs. The players weren't going to get hit in this. They weren't in charge. They shouldn't have got hit. They're not in charge. The guys who were in charge paid a price. They lost their jobs. You never hear the players mention that because they don't care that they lost their jobs. No, they don't care at all. So, so, so how can you say baseball didn't do anything? They suspended the manager. They suspended the, the general manager. They're out of baseball. Yeah, but everybody wants their pound of flesh, Mike. Yeah, but, no, but the to... players were never, and thanks for the call, but the players were never going to get touched here because they're not in charge. If Hinch had come down and said, this ends tonight, it's over. Players aren't in positions of authority. If you're a lesser player, you're going to do whatever the star players do. You're not going to rock the boat. So you're not in a position of authority. And if you are have a if you condone it, if you know it's going on and you condone it, you're responsible. And that's why guys who were in, in charge, the general manager, the manager, they paid a hefty price. They lost their jobs, and they should have. I never thought the players were going to get hit here. But here's the thing. The players can't act like they're indignant and then, oh, it's okay. Now he's on my team. No, I don't care anymore. Joe in Colonia, what's up, Joe? Hey, Mike. Thanks for taking my call. I mean, nobody's going to take anything back from the Astros, the World Series, or anything like that. But I look back at a picture of Yogi Berra wearing all of his rings, being proud of that. So my thing is, how can the Astros – Look at their ring and be proud of that. No, they cheated. Well, that's up to, to get that's that. up to the that's up to the Astros. Exactly. Well, let me ask so you this: when is, Yogi when Yogi was using his shin guard to cut the ball for Whitey, was that cheating or not cheating? 
Well, well, yeah, you got me there, Mike. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My point is there's degrees here. You know, the the Giants, if you remember, when Ralph Franco was still alive, we had him okay. on, and they talked about how the Giants were stealing signs in 51 from the center field clubhouse. Yeah. With a yeah. telescope. With a telescope. I, I, I only go back to 74. So that, but, but this is, think about it. That's why Bobby Valentine, and thanks for the call, Bobby Valentine said, hey, this has been going on for 70 years. He was right. They used a telescope. Baseball is to blame for this because all they have to do is take down the cameras. That's it. No cameras. Teams aren't allowed to have any cameras out there. That's all. If they catch you with a camera, you're dead. So that's going on now. It should have gone on then. But here's the bottom line. This was an organizational thing. That's why the manager and the general manager paid. And the owner did pay, but he should have paid more if he knew. And I don't know if the owner knew or not. I can't answer that question. But what we need to know is did it end after 17? What does baseball know and not know? And what do the Yankees know? Because the Yankees brought in a guy who was the mastermind. And they employed him. It was never discussed. Dan in Hartford, what's up, Dan? Mike, how are we doing? Good. Uh, one thing I, I got to disagree with you on is, you know, if you want Judge and, and the Yankees to pipe down, and, you know, the reason is because the Yankees shouldn't act holier than now. But Judge and Torres, those guys, they had no part of the steroid era. They All these guys have played straight up. Right. And it's affected their livelihood. Judge is going to still get paid five hundred million dollars. We know that, but why doesn't he have room to talk when he's done nothing wrong? Just because he's a Yankee? No. Listen, my point is, what are you whining about? You didn't win the series. Move on. So what? The Astros won. You didn't win anyway. They're not going to give you the series. So you think? Well, he could still be a well. Though. Well, mean, wait a second. The Yankees. The Yankees didn't win that series because they didn't hit. Not because they didn't pitch, because they didn't hit. They scored three I, runs I in four games. Okay, so if they that, so that and that had nothing to do and that had nothing to do with signals. Well, he got the MVP race for Judge too. He well, here's going, the know, problem with that. I went and looked. El Tuve was so much better on the road than he was at he home. It on the road. Hey, real quick on Cole. Uh, the only thing I have to say is. Obviously, we, we all know he knew about it, but because he didn't benefit from it, I think it's almost like a pass because I think those players... But here's the, down, thing, here's the thing, Dan. How are you calling... Either. Dan, how are you calling the team cheaters and then not calling him a cheater if he was on the team last year? But I, Because I think there's a little bit of an unwritten thing there mentally, subconsciously, that A, he didn't benefit, and B... Uh, he benefited, he, he won the, the games... Nobody would have blew, blown the whistle. Nobody did blow the whistle. Uh, and, I, I agree. You see, but here's the thing. If, if you can just – if it all that matters is he gets traded to your team and then it's all forgiven, then you really aren't that mad. No, I, and, and I, I think that's a great point. I and think, and I think that's, of, that's, that's always – yeah, yeah, it's always it's, – and thanks for the call. Always it's forgiven as soon as the guy comes to your team. Well, then you're really not that mad. Neil and Fordham, real quick. Neil, go ahead. You know, I, I think – my question is, okay, so you don't like Aaron Judge complaining about it or Cody Bellinger, but what about Mike Trout and Nick Markakis, guys that aren't complaining? I think they're, I think they're fa- listen, their fa- their points I have no problem with. I did, I have no problem with them saying they wanted, they, they thought there should be more of a punishment. That's that's their right. right. They, I have no problem with that. And there needs to be more of that. But they, but they said not, no, but, 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 but Neil, but Neil, Neil Trout said nothing was done to show you how, unaware he is or how he could care less. What do you mean nothing was done? They fired three managers over this Mike, and a general manager. But Mike, that's where that's where the players needed to be held accountable. How could you hold the players accountable when they're not in charge? What about if I'm a financial trader and I'm engaged in insider trading, does my boss get fired? If the boss the told you to do it and you would lose your no, job for doing exactly wait a second. It. The, the general manager like did tell him to do it. No, what did you? I, that's, I didn't read that. In the Manchester general before. manager. Wait a second. The manager and the general manager both knew about it. They they may have been aware. Their of job it, is to shut it down. Them. Listen, but if hey people but of a uh, Neil Neil, if you're yeah. cheating and your boss comes in and he sees you cheating and he keeps letting you cheat, 
then he is the one who's going, not you. Their job as the guys in charge was to shut it down, and that's why they lost their jobs. But the, the problem players is we have no have authority. We don't have any transparency about what went on because if we had it, they would be calling the, for the players. Heads of players. No, the players are yes. not in charge, though. Neil, they're not in charge. If the manager said shut it down, is it shut down? The manager was breaking monitors in the in the club. I said, I Neil, what I said to you is, if the manager said shut it down, is it shut down? I can't say that for sure. Come on, Neil, stop. Really Thank, no, Neil, you're law. I'll, I'll answer. Thanks for the call. I'll answer. If the manager says, guys, we're not doing that, then it's over with. The general manager says, we're not doing it. If the jan- manager says, we're not doing it, it's over. They're not doing it when the manager says, don't do it. The manager, say, the manager already said, I should have shut it down. He lost his job because he didn't shut it down. If a player had the authority to shut it down, that player would have been fined or suspended. No player has the authority to shut something down. The manager condoned it. The general manager, there's even been rumors and, and inferences that the general manager forced in it, was involved in it. So, of course, they, they used it. They did it with algorithms. They did it with other stuff using the general manager. So he was involved in it, supposedly. That's why they paid with their jobs. What do you mean no one lost their job? How can you say no one got hit here? Hinch lost his job. The general manager lost his job. Beltran lost his job. Cora lost his job. No players got hit. The players could care less about those other people losing their jobs. Brought to you each evening by Casamigos Tequila. Brought to you by those who drink it. We'll see you tomorrow.